Hey, hi everybody. Tonight we're going to do some relativity theory with ontological mathematics, and we're going to solve a problem in relativity theory, uh, which uh, Einstein created actually. Uh, this was inspired by this term cognitive disparity, which was introduced by a member of the Classic Illuminism group on Facebook. And I thought he had a really great post, it really made me think about it, and I thought I can use that concept to spring into a resolution of some problems uh, that were introduced with Einstein with relativity theory and what has subsequently uh, happened since then, as I've written about in my books, where we have instituted cognitive dissonance. And so basically, yes, our minds are being destroyed. So we go, <laughs> I mean, literally, we are in a war. It's a clandestine war. Most people don't even realize that we are in a war, but we are certainly in a war, and this war is all about the destruction of our mind simultaneously all about the destruction of our bodies and our health. That's why in my Illuminism book I talked a lot about health and health principles and how to mean, you know, eat, eating right, healthy food, things like that. We really have to maintain our physical and mental health at this point. Uh, we almost are at the point where we can't even pursue any higher ideals. We just have to sort of pull back and uh, make sure our minds and our bodies are being protected for the time being uh, and until such a time as when we can start doing more stuff. And we might be able to do uh, more stuff soon, hopefully. Anyway, let's see what happens. So, um, reconciling quantum mechanics and relativity. Relativity. What is an observer? Fixing cognitive disparity and fixing the way that our minds are being destroyed and stopping that process. Okay, so cognitive disparity. So really great comment on the Facebook group uh, by Kaspar. Kaspar, so cognitive disparity. So he, he uh, says here, cognitive dissonance we all know is an uncomfortable mental state uh, which naturally seeks resolution. But another phenomenon has increasingly become noticeable where this has become instituted, a sort of mental habituation to contradiction, illogics, and even absurdities. So he says, to identify this new nightmarish phenomenon, I propose a new term, cognitive disparity. We define cognitive disparity as the state of mind where incong incongruity in your thinking has become the new normal, it is a mental condition where contradictions are acceptable. Differences are no longer different and similarities are no longer similar and other such anomalies. So this was a brilliant insight, brilliant comment. And uh, from this, it really uh, spurred me to create this video, which I've really, this is an idea, uh, an application of ontological mathematics to relativity theory, which I had a very long time ago and simply never got around to it. Um, I'm talking like 10 years ago like with original AC slash PI stuff. Anyway, glad that I'm doing this now and it's all coming back to me. So cognitive disparity, the state of mind where incongruity in your thinking has become the new normal. So contradictions aren't merely acceptable, but they are preferred. Contradictions are the preferred explanation for events, for anything, right? And we'll see examples of that um, in uh, quantum mechanics and uh, well in this video it's going to be about um, relativity theory. I have a other slideshow ready to go about quantum mechanics on this same topic and that one's a really really fun one. Really fun one. So cognitive dissonance has replaced reality with a new hyper reality of cognitive disparity where differences are not different, similarities are not similar, we have permanent dissonant disparity, and what this is doing to our minds is it is the cessation of thought. It is the destruction of the human mind. And, well, I'll have some more comments about what's ha going to happen with this at the end, but it's what's happening. It's a state of the world we are currently living in. If you have the benefit of having read uh, the God series Hockney books, or you're just a rational person, uh, aside from that, there are many, of course, rational people, you know, people who could see this through the scamdemic, people who, you know, refuse to wear masks and go along with all that retardation, those people are likewise rational people, even though they're not, um, you know, obviously most people haven't read the Hawking material, uh, but the people who are rational are, are out there, you know, people who take care of their health, people who do independent research, you know, have independent knowledge on, you know, for example, terrain theory, right? Those are the rational people who are going to survive. And a lot of people, it simply looks like are not going to survive. Anyway, getting a little black pilled there. It's actually it's actually wonderful. It's actually great because it's going to work out for rational people in the end. We're going through a choke point. We're going through a population choke point, I think it looks like, and it's actually going to be wonderful, the result, because the only people who are going to survive are rational people, and it will be great afterwards. 
And it'll be fun going through. Honestly, it will be. <laughs> so dissonance versus disparity. Let me move myself over there. Uh, dissonance versus, so dissonance is a discomfort, right? The psychological discomfort uh, felt due to an underlying contradiction which seeks resolution to feel better. Uh, disparity is contradiction which is preferred to resolution. So uh, one thing to think about, is this the result of mass caffeine consumption? Because what happens, I mean, a lot of people might not just be, you might not be sensitive enough to your own body, your own emotional state. You might not be paying enough attention to what happens, but, you know, clean yourself of caffeine for a while and then go back and have it and see how you, how it makes you feel. So consuming caffeine induces, people are like, oh, it gives me energy for the day. It, that's not what actually happens. If you actually have a clean body and you're healthy, caffeine actually makes you tired as hell, makes you want to go to sleep. That's a normal, healthy reaction to caffeine. Um, and it also gives you angst, gives you anxiety, gives you stress, and it makes you feel like something is wrong, makes you feel like a threat is present. I hardly ever drink caffeine anymore. Last weekend I did on Mother's Day. And so with my wife and daughter, we went out to the park to fly a kite. And I had had caffeine that morning and it was a perfectly beautiful day. Nothing was wrong. And I was just in such a snappy, pissy mood, ready to snap at anything, ready to just feel like something was wrong. I just felt like something was wrong. I felt like I was under attack. I felt like everything was an attack on me. I felt, you know, if my daughter did something, you know, obviously innocently, you know, as a child does with a kite, that's, you know, not a problem. Just like made me want to snap and be like, Why'd you do that with a kite? You know, stuff like that, right? That's from caffeine. Caffeine does that to you. So it induces. So, and with this mass caffeine culture, this whole coffee culture that we live in, right? We all live that way now. So we're being acclimated to this feeling of dissonance when there shouldn't be dissonance, right? We're being acclimated to feel like this is a normal way to feel. Oh, you should drink coffee all the time. It's totally normal to feel this way, you know? And it's ruining our relationships, right? It ruins your relationship. It ruins your ability to just be cool and be chilling out and enjoying what is a nice day. Like caffeine is, is, is really psychologically unhealthy for you, you know? Uh, so anyway, we're being conditioned uh, to feel this way all the time. And that is how cognitive dissonance is being uh, um, transformed into cognitive disparity, where now we prefer the state, the feeling of something is wrong, because that's the way we just feel all the time from drinking coffee all the time. And, you know, other, they do it, you know, through the education system, as I discussed in my book, they actually condition it into you uh, in the education system. Um, so you know, origin, and we'll get to that example in a minute. So origin and historical example. So uh, obviously the Hockney books perform an excellent job of identifying and reconciling all the main historical examples of instituted cognitive disparity. Uh, you know, you could call the Hockney books sort of a, a pedagogica galactica or a compendium. Universalis, in any case, uh, historically, the worst uh, examples of instituted cognitive disparity probably be from religion. You know, for example, think of the idea of the Trinity, a, an, an idea which nobody has really ever solved. Some people say, well, it was good because it spurred a lot of critical thinking. Maybe that was good. Um, at this point, though, what's happening with cognitive disparity is it's being, uh, it, it's basically, you know, in science. It's basically the new church and you're not allowed to question it and you have to believe it and just go along with it. So we basically have a new modern form of cognitive disparity. But now it's it's not just like the Trinity and a few concepts from religion. Now it's just like universal science, society-wide, science-wide, completely instituted, you know, and then reinforced through caffeine consumption, it seems. Um, so some examples are from philosophy, although most of the time philosophers were trying to do a good job and actually reconcile things and make things make sense. Um, Except for Kant, you know, Kant was a big step backwards. He actually purposely tried to make things not make sense anymore or something anyway, whatever, God. Um, so philosophy was working to resolve everything until Einstein came along and turned it all for the worse. Einstein is really the beginning of modern instituted cognitive disparity. So we're going to show how he did that. So here's Einsteinian relativity. We're just going to discuss Einsteinian relativity. So here's a basic setup, yeah? So we have, there's a distance between these two observers and we'll just draw them as stick people A and B. So this uh, person has a flashlight and he's that little V with the arrow means he's moving in that direction. So he's moving towards this guy B who's stationary. 
So he's holding the flashlight, and when he's at this, this distance D, he just you know clicks the flashlight and it sends out a single photon. Let's just say it's a single photon because we're going to make a thought experiment here, uh, which is nice and simple. And uh, and these speeds, the speed does not have to be relativistic, right? It, it, meaning that it's a speed very close to the speed of light. This is just a very large distance, and we're in nice empty flat space. And this is a, a velocity which is small, and so the the relativistic effects are negligible to non-existent. And uh, and so the question is, to whom does the photon travel at the speed of light, a or b? So we have this concept from relativity that um, a photon has to always travel at the speed of light relative to an observer, right? I should have wrote that down in, just so that you had a reference frame there. Uh, so the the reference frame uh, from which we're supposed to think about this problem is is that a photon, the speed of light, is always the same speed relative to any observer, independent of how they're traveling. So this guy is moving, this guy isn't moving. Uh, but that has no effect on the way that they measure the speed of light. They both measure the speed of light to be the same speed. Yeah. So when we have this case with a single photon, which this guy has emitted from his flashlight at this distance d, and this photon starts traveling, traversing this distance toward the b, to whom does the photon travel at the speed of light? Relative to a or relative to b? So the thing is, if it travels at the speed of light relative to a, then the time of arrival at b for the photon is this term, d over b plus c. Now, if the photon is traveling at the speed of light relative to b, then you get this equation. The time of arrival of the photon is just d over c. So those are two different times, right? So this is the origin of the simultaneity paradox in Einstein's interpretation, what Einstein did with relativity. So <clears throat> basically what has to happen in Einstein's interpretation is that the photon has to travel at c, that's the constant speed, we just use c uh, for the speed of a photon. So the photon has to travel at c relative to both a and b. So the photon, let me repeat that, so the photon, because the photon, because in Einstein's interpretation, Einstein said that a photon has to travel, or well, Einstein didn't say, say this, this is known already, but just the idea is that a photon has to travel at the speed of light relative to any observer, right? And so if this guy's moving and this guy's not, then that means that the, this photon has to travel at the speed of light relative to this guy and also relative to this guy. But that's going to be two different speeds because this guy already has a speed, right? So the photon has to do two different things at the same time, right? It has to travel at C, the speed of light, relative to both A and B at the same time. So that means that it has to do two different things and travel at two different speeds at the exact same time. So this is instituted cognitive disparity where cognitive dissonance is inculcated into the subject, the student, you know, learning Einstein's theory that Einstein came up with. <clears throat> so as being, is inculcated into the subject as being the sensation of intelligence. So cognitive dissonance is being inculcated into the student when the student learns Einstein's interpretation, that this is something intelligent to think. So what happens is that you associate being intelligent, you associate intelligent thought with cognitive dissonance, which becomes eventually instituted cognitive disparity. So that is your recipe for total destruction of mentation. And of course, in modern times today, we have many such examples of that, don't we? Right? I need not even discuss them. Anyone who's paying attention, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are, we are surrounded and inundated by many such examples of opposites being the same and the same thing being opposites and just all sorts of utter insanity, one thing being two different things at the same time, etc., 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 right? So this trend in modern thinking, which is actually the cessation of human thinking, was actually begun by Einstein. He's the one that started it. Um, so let's define the observer. We're going to start resolving this problem now. So the speed of light is constant for an observer. So just to make it clear, that's not Einstein's discovery. It was discovered well before Einstein uh, by multiple other scientists. Um, Einstein actually dismissed this principle, but while pretending it was still the foundational principle, it was a very clever trick what he did, a very clever trick. So this is what you need to think about. This photon is in mid-flight. It's here in the middle of space. 
It's not interacting with A, and it's not interacting with B, is it? So who's actually observing it then? Is it being observed? So what Einstein did was say, because you're observing this photon in this diagram, then you can imagine that A is observing that photon, and you can imagine that B is observing that photon here, just like you are observing it on that diagram. But that's not actual the actual physics of what it's occurring. You know, this is something that's become a speciality of mine, of course, with this whole flat earth theory in modern physics, right? They have this flat earth diagram for climate science, and I point out to them, that's not actual physics. Although you can write it down and draw it and put some numbers to it, and pretend it makes sense and use some scientific language, it's not actual physics. So when Einstein said that A observes this photon and B observes this photon, he's actually dismissing the idea that the speed of light has to be constant for an observer because neither A nor B is actually observing the photon when it's in mid-flight. So do you see that trick? So you have this diagram and you have this little photon drawn in this diagram and you're seeing it in this sort of God mode diagram. So you think, Okay, so I'm seeing that photon, which is just a line drawn on the piece of paper. But because you can do that, you're being tricked psychologically into the, and thinking that A is also capable of observing that photon, and B is also capable of observing that photon, when that photon is in the middle of the space between them. But that's not the actual physics of what can occur, is it? A actually cannot observe that photon because it's out here. You can only observe a photon when it interacts with you, when it hits your retina and creates a chemical reaction. Or if you have a camera, you know, the same thing, produces some sort of chemical reaction. Then you observe the photon. That's the observation. But while the photon is in mid-flight, there's no observation taking place. So that was what Einstein did to introduce cognitive disparity, uh, to introduce cognitive dissonance as intelligence, right? So it's sort of an autistic view of this diagram. It's, you know, it's just very materialistic, very autistic. Oh, I'm seeing this diagram. I can see this photon. Therefore, A can see that photon, and B can see that photon too, just like I can in this diagram that I drew. No, that's not actual too. You need to think about the actual physics that's occurring, right? I mean, how silly and childish, right? What, what he, it's, it's so silly what he did. A is not observing the photon. A isn't capable of observing that photon because it's in mid-space and going away from A. A never interacts with it again. B does eventually interact with that photon, and that's important. Um, one thing that could be considered just from quantum mechanics, for example, is that something unobserved is undefined, right? So if it's undefined, there's no un, there's no absolute relationship. So they should have conned on, on to this, the physicists, actually, already by now, um, I, I, you know, as a potential solution to the simultaneity paradox problem. Uh, because if that photon isn't being observed, just like the cat, you know, the cat inside a box that's not observed uh, is in both a an alive and a dead state. So this photon being in the midpoint in space here between A and B not being observed because it can't be observed because it's not interacting with them. So then it can be traveling at the speed of light and also not at the speed of light because it's undefined. It can be anything, right? So there is no actual relationship. There's especially not a relationship with A because A never observes it. B will eventually observe it. And so there is an eventual relationship there. And that's actually important. So let's continue. So here the photon has finished traversing the distance and is at B interacting with that B. Let's pretend B is a camera or that photon is going in his eyes or, or just hitting his body or whatever. Um, so B is the eventual observer to which the constancy of the speed of light must apply for the life history of the photon. Because if B was running an experiment and he knew where that photon started, right? then B has to measure that for the life history of the photon, that photon traveled at the speed of light because B is the actual observer, right? So A will never observe that photon. A will never observe the photon, but B does observe the photon. So, but the big question to ask yourself then is how can the rule apply before B was actually able to physically interact? Because that photon started off at A, when it was at distance d, and then traverse the space towards b, right? But how can that rule apply before b, like for that lifetime, for that history, for the lifetime history of that photon, how can that rule apply before b was actually able to physically interact as the observer? Because the rule applies to the observer. The rule does not apply to the non-observer, right? So for an observer 
the speed of light has to be constant. So B is the eventual observer. A is never the observer, right? So the rule doesn't have to apply to A because A isn't the observer. B is the observer, but B is the observer in the future. But then how can that rule apply to something that occurs in the future, right? So it's because the life history of the photon is defined instantaneously at its creation because there's no time nor space from the photon's perspective because a photon has infinite time dilation. I'll show the equation in a moment. A photon has infinite time dilation and length contraction for a photon traveling at sea, right? So the eventual observer is defined for the photon across any spatial distance. So it kind of implies that spatial distance is an illusion then, doesn't it? Now, isn't that strange? Think of how profound that is. So the resolution of this paradox that Einstein created, you know, and this fact that uh, B will always measure this photon, would be traveling at that speed of light, which means that that photon must have had that relationship with B in the entire history of the photon, the, the photon's lifetime, it implies then that, you know, and you, you apply our knowledge from ontological mathematics is, and it's that, well, wait a minute, a photon doesn't experience either time or space, right? So the eventual observer B is actually defined at the moment when the photon is emitted by A, its eventual observer B must already be defined. And how can it be defined? Well, because from a photon's perspective, there's no time or space. So it's possible for the photon to have its eventual observer. What is to us an eventual observer? For the photon, it's the instantaneous observer because there's no time or space for the photon, right? So that implies that spatial distance is an illusion, doesn't it? But that's actually what we know from ontological mathematics, that all of existence exists in a mental singularity. Spatial distance is in fact an illusion. We know that. That's the structure of existence in ontological mathematics. Now, granted it's a well-formed illusion, it is a very well-formed illusion, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, it is still, uh, you know, an illusion. It, it's, a, it's a thought. Um, so finally, with this, we can define what an observer is. And just uh, simplifying it, making it most general, uh, it is a fermion which interacts with a boson. Uh, so that would be your definition of what an observer is. So that's something that they struggle with in quantum mechanics is determined. And even, you know, in, as, as we saw, it, the problem originates in Einstein's interpretation of relativity theory, where he says that A and B can both be observers of things that it's actually impossible for them to observe. You know, that photon is mid-flight. You know, obviously, as we just discussed, B is the eventual observer. So B is actually the instantaneous eventual observer. The photon actually knows that B is its observer because from the photon's perspective, there's no time or space. A, on the other hand, is never the observer because A never interacts with that photon. A releases the photon with its flashlight, uh, but A never uh, observes it, actually. It just goes away from A. So uh, the most general definition of an observer would then be uh, a fermion which interacts with a boson or when a fermion interacts with a boson. So absolute reference frame, if the relationship of a photon speed is defined instantaneously for its observer, then the speed of light is the absolute reference frame. That is the interpretation you would have to go with. And that, of course, that is, you know, what we learn from ontological mathematics. Uh, so the speed of light is a thought. It's a thought which provides the movement of a point source about a circling which allows for the satisfaction of the infinity multiplier, as I discussed in my Illuminism book, to produce all possible circling sizes and all possible frequencies. So it is a constant thought shared by all. So whenever you interact with a photon, which is a circling, a base circling, you're always interacting with that thought that the photon is a result of constant motion, of a constant movement. So that's why you always interact with that thought. That's why you always measure then that that photon uh, had a constant speed. Neat, right? So relationship between A and photon is undefined. Uh, there's no observation that A ever makes of this photon. The relationship between B and the photon is defined because B is the, and we can, this, this is, this sounds like cognitive dissonance, but it's actually consistent with our understanding of a photon, a photon's experience of space-time and our experience. So B is the instantaneous slash eventual observer. So instantaneous for the photon, eventual for us. 
there's no time or distance for the photon. And we'll be able to build off of this uh, for the double slit experiment. So that was that. So just to finish with a few comments, um, yeah, why not publish something like this? Well, you can't publish things like this in science anymore in peer review journals because cognitive disparity is now sacrosanct. It's the law of the land and it cannot and will not be violated. Um, I did actually try publishing a paper about this before uh, meeting the AC and PI, uh, the Pythagorean Illuminati people, the Hockney books. Um, that went nowhere. And subsequently in the time uh, that's happened since then, if you're familiar with my books, I have now found that one cannot even publish a paper saying that the earth is round for climate science. So that's how bad cognitive disparity is in science. It, it's like, it's a total wasteland out there. You can't trust anything that's happening out there. Like I said in my book, Illuminism, you can't trust a thing that's happening out there anymore. It's all a complete uh, gong show shit show. Like you can't trust anything out there anymore. Like nothing from the news, nothing from science, nothing, because it's all now built on cognitive disparity. Uh, yeah, one solution might be to develop a tech which can only function or be designed or understood with a new paradigm. That'd probably be the only way. If you can develop a new tech that does something really fantastic. What I would like to develop is uh, instantaneous communication across any spatial distance. That should be something which you can develop because you should be able to c communicate through the singularity domain. And since the singularity domain, and as we just saw, all spatial distance is actually illusory, although it's well-founded, you should still be able to work uh, with this understanding and this principles to get uh, information communication to be able to occur across any spatial distance. Um, because of course, that's what a photon is doing already anyway from its perspective. But how can we pull that out um, in our sort of extended space-time experience? There's got to be a way to do it. And that would be, uh, if you did it, you know, that'd be an example of a tech which only functions, that'd be a way to overturn the paradigm. You're never going to be able to overturn the paradigm just by writing a paper and say, look, here's a new interpretation. It's just not going to happen. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, maybe. I don't know. It'd have to be the right person. You'd have to have... I, I just think it's very unlikely because it's just so, so ingrained now. Cognitive disparity is just so ingrained now. They want it. They prefer it, right? Um, if you, if, you know, the only new explanation you could come up with is one which is even more disparate and incongruous, you know, that, that would be the only, only thing you could actually get published. Um, so cognitive disparity world, that's the world we live in. It's clown world, uh, in such a society, you can't do anything to fix it. So save yourself and those who, for whatever reason, already like you, rational, uh, you basically got to go back to the basic principles of survival going to have to let the rest fall away and extinct themselves because it just really seems like there's nothing you can do now at this point. Um, so go back to the basics. Make sure you're putting real food into your body, keeping the chemicals out. Uh, they're, they're trying to kill you. They're, they're destroying your mind. They are purposefully destroying your mind with kind of disparity. Uh, they really want to wreck us. They want to wreck humanity. It's clear. It's very clear the food supply is being poisoned. Uh, agriculture, all that, you know, education being poisoned, it's all directed at destruction. So you want to survive. We're, we're coming up. It looks, seems pretty clear. We're coming up to a, some sort of a choke point here. Uh, so keep your body and your mind healthy and you'll, you'll survive. Um, yeah, so very long-term plan thinking. That's where you're at now. Um, yeah, I was supposed to have the gamma equation right back here just to show, you know, it's a the inverse of the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, I mean, big deal, whatever. It just means that uh, it's just the equation which shows that uh, for a photon, that time dilation is infinite and length contraction is infinite. So, which means that there's no time nor any space uh, for the photon. Okay, so had a bit of science in there, had a bit of physics, ontological mathematics, and also a little bit of a lack of feeling. But like I said, don't be black filled. I know, cut. I'm kind of black filled a lot of the time. But on the other hand, uh, you just got to survive. So that's why I put all that in my Illuminism book. You, you, at this point, you just have to survive. Um, hopefully, the system doesn't, you know, just crack down on everyone who's just, you know, choosing to be healthy and not allowing you, locking you down and, you know, fencing you off and, you know, like they did in Australia, you know, rounded people up, rounded people up who wanted to stay healthy and, you know, put them in camps, internment camps. Okay, anyway, so 
That is how you resolve the simultaneity paradox in physics. That's how you define what an observer is. That's how you begin to start solving the cognitive disparity uh, which Einstein introduced, which started with relativity theory, Einstein's relativity theory. That is where modern cognitive disparity uh, started, and it extended from Einstein's relativity and then found its way into quantum mechanics, where of course particles are doing two different things or in two different places at the same time. Uh, so just as how we can solve uh, what Einstein did with ontological mathematical thinking, uh, we can likewise begin solving these problems in quantum mechanics. And that's what the next show episode is going to be. Uh, so I'll publish that one. The slideshow for that one is already ready to go. And I will, uh, yeah, put that one out maybe in a few days or a week or something. Okay. Uh, hope you're all doing very well. Thank you. Bye-bye.